Amen. Amen. Um, so let's turn it over to Pastor Ophelia as she leads us for today's uh, time of worship. And uh, let me just get the slide for today's uh, worship song up. And Share the screen. And I'll turn it over to Pastor Phil. Good morning, everybody. David, I heard you shared my favorite uh, scripture, Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Oh, yeah, I didn't know it was your favorite. That's my <laughs> life verse. That's truly my life verse. Absolutely. I'm telling you, it's gotten me through the last few weeks. I'll tell you that. Absolutely. Peace is important. Yes. Yeah. Good to see everybody. Hey, everybody. You know, I miss this. I miss this part of the service where we get to catch up on how everybody's doing and give everybody a hug and say howdy. And Absolutely. Yeah. We do virtual hugs. <laughs> I know. Air hugs, air hugs. It's not the same, but <laughs> not at all. It's the next best thing. I agree, Brother David. You don't realize how much you need hugs until you don't have them. True. Yeah. I'm just getting food after service with people. Absolutely. I bow with my Betty. Yeah. Hi, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> All right. Well, let's try this uh, again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we are in the virtual land of church, and thanks be to God that perfection is not what we are called to, um, and God is still able to be glorified. Um, so one of the things, the song, as you probably saw before we went dark and um, um, and right now that's up is you deserve it. And I just was thinking about this. If we think about the events of 2020, um, there's so much to praise the Lord for. Um, if we think about uh, the course of our life, there's so much that we can say God deserves our praise about. If we consider just the mere fact that he is God, um, that's even enough to say that our Lord is deserving of all 
of the praise, of all of the glory, of all of the honor. And so whether you know the song, it's very easy. It simply just starts off with my hallelujah belongs to you. And that is my prayer that as we are singing it, we are really contemplating the, the words that my hallelujah, my praise, it belongs to you, Lord. That all of the glory, it belongs to the Lord. And for the mere fact that he just simply deserves it. And so if you can sing along with me and um, let's give our God praise. Amen. My hallelujah belongs to you. My hallelujah belongs to you. My hallelujah belongs to you. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. My hallelujah belongs to you. 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 You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. You deserve it. All of the glory, all of the glory belongs to you. All of the glory belongs to you. All of the glory belongs to you. To you. Let's sing it out now. All of the glory belongs to you. You deserve it. 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 My 
hallelujah, Lord. If that's true for your house, can we sing that? My hallelujah belongs to you. Because he's worthy, say, my hallelujah belongs to you. My highest praise, that's my hallelujah belongs to you. Hallelujah. Can you clap your hands where you are? Can you lift your hands and just say hallelujah? Thank you, Jesus. We are in this season of reminding ourselves to be grateful. And so, Lord, we say hallelujah. We say you deserve all of the glory, even though the circumstances seemingly around us are difficult. God, because you are who you are, you deserve our hallelujah. You deserve our thank you, Jesus. You deserve the praise that just rises up from the depths of us. Hallelujah to your great name, because you deserve all of the glory, all of the honor, and all of the praise. Hallelujah. 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 We thank you, Jesus, hallelujah. We glory, God, in who you are. We give it to you, God, because you are worthy of all the honor, all the glory, and all of the praise. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. My hallelujah belongs to you, O oh Lord, and we give him all the praise, the glory, and the honor. You know, uh, it's interesting because in this season, um, you know, uh, I can be honest and say that my devotional life is not as it used to be. And, um, you know, as you're waking up, just trying to sometimes make it through the day. Um, for those of you who are parents, um, you're trying to make sure that your kids still stay alive at the end of the day, um, you know, and just, um, you know, in all of that, um, sometimes we enter into seasons where it's not the easiest um, to give our hallelujah or to give our best praise, but God deserves it. Yes, he deserves yes. it. And, um, you know, I think one of the things is that the Bible invites us to now let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise. Um, um, and, and that sacrifice means that sometimes even when you come on to the call or you're listening via Facebook on Sunday morning or um, you're just worshiping, sometimes maybe you don't feel like singing, maybe you don't feel joyous, maybe you don't feel like, like everything is going right, all right. Maybe you're asking God, Lord, where are you in the midst of it? But as you give the sacrifice of praise, God meets us where we are. God comes and inhabits the praises of his people. And so I invite you that uh, no matter what, and you know, I know I grew up kind of in, in, a, in, a, in a tradition where, you know, it was like, if you didn't have 30 minutes devotion a day, you know, you weren't really saved. You know, are you really saved if you, if you don't spend 30 times, 30 minutes in your word and, 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 and going before God? Um, but I'm so thankful that God loves me even when I don't spend my 30 minutes there. God loves me and he wants to hear from me. And so even just the hallelujah, um, he wants to hear that. He wants to, he wants to hear that praise. And um, uh, I invite you, don't stop giving him the praise. Don't oh, stop worshiping oh. uh, him for all that he has done. Because, you know, the Bible tells us that uh, uh, don't stop doing what is good. For it says that, uh, uh, you know, even though we're growing weary, we will reap a harvest yes. if we faint not. 
And, um, you know, I know it, it, it's cliche, you know, for pastors to, you know, at the end of the year to say, I'm going into my breakthrough and whatever the next year is, you know, uh, you know, they find a rhyming word that goes with whatever the next year is, is, is going to be. But, you know, I, I am thoroughly convinced 2021 is going to be a breakthrough year. Um, and I'm believing God for it. And I believe that even at the ending of this 2020, that God has some great things in store for us. And so um, let's keep rejoicing. Let's keep believing God. I, I don't know. I, I just I just feel the need to um, build up one another's faith this morning. I feel the need um, for us to be encouraged in our, our most holy and precious faith because some of us, we, we've lost heart, but I believe the Lord is saying, keep trusting in him, keep believing in him, keep knowing that he is God and watch what God will do. And uh, it ties actually right into what we're going to study uh, this morning. And so uh, as we're building up your faith, uh, let me not get ahead of what the Lord wants to do today. Um, so I'm going to invite you to turn, if you have in your Bibles, um, to the book of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Um, and uh, if you can believe it, um, we are um, uh, closing out almost uh, uh, the end of 1 Samuel. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, kind of uh, go through uh, uh, two chapters today, and there's kind of three key points I want to uh, highlight for you in, in these um, uh, uh, two chapters. And then next week, we're going to close out. Um, uh, um, next week, we're going to close out First uh, Samuel, um, uh, uh, um, the book of First Samuel. And I'm going to ask um, some uh, guests um, to help us in teaching uh, next week's lesson. And then uh, Thanksgiving, uh, we have Thanksgiving. And then the week after Thanksgiving, uh, we're uh, going to open uh, for kind of a time of thanks and for each of us to kind of share some testimonies and stories. And I'll share a little bit more about how uh, that will happen. And that will happen the week after Thanksgiving. And so uh, I'm excited. Um, we have, um, it has been, it has been awesome kind of uh, diving into this book together. Um, you know, it's taken a while. <laughs> um, uh, we've had patience, diligence, but it, it is, it, it is, it's good to kind of zoom in because so much of our um, time and study of the word is either, you know, a quick sermon, a quick, you know, we're in this chapter, we're in this chapter, um, but to really focus in, to really kind of um, um, bear into this book of First Samuel uh, has been a, a great time of study um, together. So um, again, uh, if you uh, are with us today, uh, I'll invite you to turn to First uh, Samuel chapter number 29. Uh, we'll read chapter number 29 together, um, and then we will go to chapter um, uh, chapter uh, 30 and uh, share some thoughts and nuggets from that. So let me share my screen and um, have that there. Um, and so uh, we will start reading uh, at verse number one of chapter number 29. And then uh, if I can, it uh, goes up to verse number 11. So I'll have uh, asked Nehemiah to read. Um, let's have the, the, young, uh, the young disciples uh, uh, to, to read today. So I'm gonna ask uh, Nehemiah to read uh, 29 and verse number one through verse number um, six. And then we will have, uh, we'll ask uh, Quentin um, to read verse seven through 11. The Philistines gathered all their forces at Aphek in the Israel camp by the spring in Jezreel. As the Philistine rulers marched with their units of hundreds and thousands, David and his men were marching at the rear with Aches. 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 The, um, the commanders of the Philistines asked, what about these Hebrews? Aches asked. Reply. Um, replied, is this not David who was an officer of Saul, king of Israel? He has already been with me for over a year. And from the day he left Saul until now, I have found no fault in him. But the Philistine commanders were angry with him and said, send the man back and he may return to the place you assign him. He must not go with us into battle or he will turn against us during the fighting. 
how better could he regain his master's favor than by taking the heads of our own men? Isn't this the David they sing about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. So Ashi called David and said to him, as surely as the Lord lives, you have been reliable and I would be pleased to have you serve with me in the army. From the day you came to me until now, I have found no fault in you, but the rulers don't approve of you. Now turn back and go in peace. Do nothing to displease the Philistine rulers. But what have I done? asked David. What have you found against your servant from the day I came to you now? Why can't I go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Akish, Ashish answered, I know that you have been, been as pleasing in my eyes as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the Philistine commanders has, have said, he, has must, he must not go up with us into battle. Uh, now get up early along with your master's servant who have come to, with you and leave in the mor morning as soon as it is light. So David and his men got up early in the morning to go back to the land of the Philistines and the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Uh, thank you, Nehemiah and Quentin for uh, helping us read uh, uh, in our study today. And so um, a couple of things that are important to note as we begin to dive into uh, this uh, aspect of our study uh, today is that remember that David is um, David is the story highlights David, but David is traveling along with 600 men. Um, these are his 600 mighty men. Um, you know, if I can use the common vernacular, this was his posse. These were these were the people that were riding along with him, and and wherever David went, his men went to as well. And they fought, they fought with David. They were, they were all in. Um, but part of it was that a lot of these men were misfits. They were people who were outsiders. And so David had to train them not only to be great warriors, but he had to train them with the heart that David had. And you know, important thing about a leader is that a leader casts vision and, and it has to help people follow that vision and walk um, um, with that vision. And so what is interesting is you remember a couple of chapters back, there was a, uh, we, we had a second incident where David encounters Saul directly. And remember in that incident, um, uh, David um, uh, um, finds Saul and uh, the Lord call, the Lord makes all of the guards people around him. So it would be the equivalent of the secret service who would guard, you know, a, a leader. Basically the Lord caused a deep slumber to come upon all of them. And so, you know, that that was a miraculous act. That was God's hand and God's handiwork were causing something to happen. And so in the midst of that moment, after that, David um, the, uh, David goes to uh, King Saul and says, why are you continuing to chase after me? You know, I'm not guilty. If I'm guilty, let's solve this right now and I will repent. But if I'm not guilty, then you are basically listening to gossip and you're listening to people um, who have uh, something ag against me and may God, you know, bring vengeance to those who are bringing um, basically um, false claims against me. Um, and, um, you know, it was interesting. I was reading um, uh, the story of a man who was just released, I believe it was in Pennsylvania, but I, I can't say for certain. But basically, he was released after 15 years for a crime he did not commit for a crime he did not commit. Now, this is commonplace in, un unfortunately, in our American um, um, judicial system. And that's one of the reasons why when you hear cries of justice and cries for um, justice, especially for black men, um, it is, you know, um, statistics like that, that are, that are disheartening. But can you imagine, I mean, first of all, think back, you know, for all of us, think back 15 years ago. Um, for some of us on this call, you weren't even alive. Um, but 
think of the last 15 years if you were imprisoned um, for a crime that you did not commit. Um, and so you can, you can imagine how you would feel if you were going through that. That is likely how David felt as Saul was chasing after him and as Saul was um, you know, uh, trying to kill him every which way. And you know, the craziest part is that David was one of Saul's most loyal warriors. Um, and you know, it's interesting because sometimes the people that are most loyal, um, um, uh, the two, uh, some of the you know people who are most loyal to us, we can push away because of jealousy or you know thinking like you know oh they're they're the harmony and not even really knowing um, uh, you know the objective that they have. So, anyways, all of that to say, David wised up. David was like, look, I'm going to get away. I'm going to you know I'm going to find an opportunity to get away from King Saul because I'm tired of running from him. And um, so David finds himself, when he, he determines to run away, he makes an interesting choice. He decides, <coughs> excuse me, he decides to run away. Can you get me some more, please? Um, he decides to run away to the land of the Philistines. Um, and King Ashish, uh, he, he had, uh, interacted with King Ashish before, and um, in that he says, "Look, I'm claiming. I want to claim asylum. Um, you know, give me, give me some land." And basically, the king gave him land in a far kind of remote area called Ziklag. Now, let me pause and ask this question, um, or or let me take a poll real quick. How many of you think that it was a good decision for David to go? and to make his home in the land of the Philistines, which was the enemy of the Israelites. How many of you, um, uh, maybe by a show of hands, how many of you think that was a good idea? Okay, got a couple. How many of you think that it was not a good idea? Okay. And how many of you just don't know or not, they're not sure even what you're talking about? <laughs> All right, good, 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 good. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's interesting to me because, you know, one thing that is interesting about studying the word of God is that sometimes there are questions that, you know, are good to kind of like wrestle with but we don't always have answers with. Like, uh, you know, I, was, I used to talk to, uh, you know, some professors in seminary and they're like, well, you know, when I get to heaven, I got a list of questions that I got to ask Jesus when I, when I get there about certain things that happened and certain things that took place um, that, you know, didn't quite make sense. And so, you know, I think one of the challenges and we're going to see this come to head. And the reason I asked this question is because, you know, when you make your bed with your enemy, um, you become influenced by your enemy. Um, you know, that's why you hear a lot of times when the Bible says in the Old Testament, um, when, I, when I bring you into the land that, you, uh, that I've given to you, don't be like, you know, the neighbors of that land and worship their foreign gods. Um, and, and even it prevented their intermarriage because God did not want their pagan practices to come into, uh, at that time was true Israel, into true Israel. And so one of the things that is interesting is that David has now a quandary. And, and it started in the last chapter where the Philistines decided that they were going to attack Israel. Israel is David's people. So David has to make a choice now. David either has to choose to rebuke the people that have been given him land, shelter, and safety over the last year, or he has to choose to attack his own people. Um, 
how many of you can be honest? We, 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 we won't be able to see it on Facebook. So, so you can raise your hand. How many of you can be honest that you got yourself in situations where uh, you weren't in the right place or at the, you know, in the right situation um, and you had a quandary before you and, and some wrong, you know, there were, there were not really any good choices. You know, it was two bad choices. And, and I can be honest, I, I, I've done that over the years. Um, you know, uh, it can be due to my imprudence or uh, due to my, you know, just wanting to do what I wanted to do or uh, my naivete. Um, and so I think one of the interesting things is that David, um, you know, David, not only is David has this challenge that um, King Ashish and the Philistines are going to find him, but David had been appointed the king's bodyguard. So he had been appointed the king's bodyguard. So he he really had no choice but to go and to fight. And so here's the interesting thing. So um, as they're going to fight, um, David and his men uh, and his men formed a rank at the uh, 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 at the rear of the garrison of the Philistine fighters. Now, one of the interesting things um, that happens is that. As they're preparing for battle, the other commanders of the Philistines began getting suspicious uh, about these Hebrews. Um, so, you know, why why is David and his men fighting with us? You know, it, it is, um, you know, unfortunately, many of us heard about um, uh, there was a, a, a military base. I was, it, was it Florida or uh I can't remember where the military base was, but we had some foreign people who were training there. And unfortunately they, they defected and attacked um, the military base. And so, you know, this was kind of the thought, you know, it's like, well, I don't know if I can trust you, you know, how loyal are you um, to us? And so here's one of the blessings is that the king quickly comes to David's defense and he says, and he says, is this not David who was an officer or, or um, uh, excuse me, um, uh, he says, he's already been with me for over a year. And from the day he left Saul until now, I have found no fault in him. And so, you know, it's interesting that <laughs> King Saul, who was, you know, the one that, you know, God had given David to, couldn't trust David. But the one who was truly the enemy of the Israelites could trust David with everything. Um, it's an interesting contrast between King Saul and King Ashish and, and how they responded to that. Um, but the whole challenge was that the person, the commanders, um, uh, the commanders, even though that there was a personal um, assurance from the king, um, they didn't trust David or his men. And, and they said this, send the men back that he may return to the place you assigned him. He must not go with us in battle or he will turn against us um, uh, during the fighting. How better could he regain his master's favor by taking the heads of our own men? Now, lest you think that they're just kind of, you know, skittish, um, you'll remember that if you go back to chapter number 14, 1 Samuel chapter number 14, um, there was a previous battle that happened. And you remember that the Lord caused, they had had some Hebrews who were fighting with the Philistines and the Lord caused um, the Hebrews to turn upon the Philistines and then it caused confusion in the camp. So, you know, basically the commanders knew like, well, having mixed company, I don't know if you can trust them because the last time that we had this happen, um, they turned against us. Um, and so, the commanders, you know, it was not unfounded um, that there was hesitance um, to have um, uh, uh, David join them. Um, what's interesting is King Ashish uh, affirms David and tells him, okay, this is what I have to have you do. He says, as surely as the Lord lives, you've been reliable, and I would be pleased, <clears throat> excuse me, to have you serve with me in the army. To the day you came until now, I have found no fault in you, but the rulers don't approve of you. Turn back and go in peace. Do nothing to displease the Philistine ruler. So, you know, he basically says, look, I trust you. You've been faithful to me, you know, all the days that you've been with me. But, you know, they don't approve of having you fight this battle. 
turn back, go in peace, and do nothing to squeeze the Philistines' Lord. Now, I think what King of Sheesh was thinking was like, David, don't get mad at the Philistine rulers and they go and, you know, and, and, and do what they're thinking you're going to do, uh, except before we even get to battle. And, and so I think that was happening. And, and the interesting response from David, he says like, but what have I done? Why, what have I, uh, what have you found against your servant from the day I came to you until now? Why can't I go and fight against the enemies of my Lord, the King? Now, this is interesting because commentators wonder, um, when David proposes, why can't I go and fight against the enemies of my Lord, the King? Now, when he's speaking to King Ashish, who is the enemy of King Ashish and the Philistines? Saul. Saul. And who else? Israel. Israel. Huh. So is David saying that he wants to go and get Saul? Is David saying that he wants to take out Saul? Or I don't know. I mean, it, the scriptures are not clear. Um, and I'm going to come back to this point in, the, in a moment. You're going to see it here. And the sheesh answers, I know you have been as pleasing in my eyes as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the Philistine commanders have said he must not go into battle. Now get up early along with your master servant who have come with you and leave you uh, in the morning as soon as light. So the next morning, David and his men got up to go back to the land of Philistines and the Philistines went up against Jezreel to fight against Israel. So um, before I get to the punchline, does anybody see how in chapter 29, God can be working towards something that is not immediately obvious. Yeah, I, I see God getting David off the hook. Uh, I, I see David's initial response being an honorable one. I mean, mm -hmm. he's living in, Phil, in, in Philistine territory. He's under the jurisdiction of Achish and he's, he's just trying to be a good citizen. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's going to put him in a position of having to lift a sword against not only his own people, but the people he's going to be ruling in just a yes. few months. And, and, and I, I believe David would have done it. I don't know that if it came down to it, he would have killed Saul, but he, I, I really believe he was serious. He would have done it as, as a, a citizen of Achish, under Achish. Mm -hmm. And this is God. This, 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 to me, this has, this screams God. Mm. This is God using people unwittingly to get David off the hook and, and not put him in that position. Mm, mm, mm. Anybody else? Great, great insight, Brother David. No, I totally agree with Brother David. I think it was the Lord protecting David mm. from mm. having to make this decision. Like it was strategic to have him go with the Philistines in the first place because that was the last place Saul was gonna go, right? Mm -hmm. But the time for that protection was over. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure David was wrestling with the idea of like, if I have to go to war against my own people to prove my loyalty to Achish, how am I gonna get out of that? Like, how is that gonna work? I've been anointed king, these are my people. I don't wanna have to kill my own people to prove my loyalty to an enemy. But the enemy has been good to me. I'm sure that was all like, how are we going to get out of this? And God opens a way where David is protected yeah. by his enemy, but he's also protected from having to go against his own people. Only God mm. could have done that. Mm -hmm. So I think in this moment, when he says, what have I done? I think in the, who knows, but this is completely like my interpretation, but it could have been David saying, woo, this is my way out, but let me look like, I wouldn't have done it. I would, yeah, I would right. have done it, right? Like if I had to go fight for you, I'd have been right there. But dude, all right, peace out. Right, they, right, right. Them, but rejoicing in the fact that he didn't have to make that decision, that God mm -hmm. made the way where the decision was made for him mm -hmm, and still mm -hmm. protected him and his men. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen, amen. So also that in previous chapters, we've seen David is making these raids in neighboring communities and telling Ashish that he's 
you know, attacking Israel and he's not. So I, I don't know. I kind of read this and I feel like the Philistines are absolutely correct to not trust him at all in this situation. But. <laughs> well, he did kind of lie to the king, um, uh, um, you know, in terms of where he was raiding. Yeah. Um, and as a matter of fact, the reason why they uh, we're going to learn in the next chapter, uh, there's revenge is because of what David had done. So. I mean, and it, it, it does put him, in, it would put him in an impossible position. Like if, you know, to like, he would be like in the heart of the enemy of Israel, right? Like mm -hmm. it would be hard to be in a position where you're like, well, I could, you know, just like switch sides. And uh, yeah, no, it's really tricky. I do think that the way out is valuable here. Mm -hmm. Anyone else, any comments? I think it's cool that, um, God put David in a position where he wasn't there when Saul eventually dies and he mm. didn't have to draw the sword. He didn't have to break his word. Mm -hmm. He took him out of the, completely out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a very important part is that because David is not in this battle, we're going to know, I mean, spoiler alert, <laughs> King Saul dies uh, uh, in the next, uh, in, in chapter 31. Um, but David is not there. And as a matter of fact, he's far from, he's over a hundred miles um, from where King Saul will die. Uh, the Browns, uh, you have a comment? Yeah, it, 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 it's, it's a saving grace because um, he couldn't come back from this. God mm -hmm. has made him king over Israel. He cannot be, if he's king, um, put in place by the Philistines, mm -hmm. um, that negates the power of God. Mm, so mm. this ends up, you know, helping to, to show the fact that God has put David in control, yes. not Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, anyone else, any comments? So the Bible is not clear um, I tend to think, well, so one of uh, so before I get to that point, David is growing in character and knowledge. And we've got to realize that David is, um, remember when they go to, Samuel goes to anoint the next king. And you remember, you know, um, the brothers are, are, are well, actually, um, uh, the, this is after he's been anointed and the brothers are out at war. And then they're like, David, what are you doing here? You troublemaker. Um, and David, like, you know, we tend to think of David like in his most mature um, state, which is David being a man after God's own heart. But we, you know, and, and this is this is the challenge that I have. Um, you know, a lot of times we love to tell the success stories, but we don't tell what it was like when you were still living in the trailer park, you were still, you know, uh, on food stamps, you were still, you know, um, you know, <laughs> wrestling in the gang or, you know, whatever, you know, whatever was the history, um, you know, and I, I, I love, you know, documentaries that kind of tell the full story and not that living in a trailer park is bad, um, um, you know, but just, you know, whatever situation or circumstance that you went through that was difficult for you, and, and learned and grew through it. And, and part of the reason why I think it is most important that we know and understand that is because a lot of times we want to model our lives after the ending of where people have matured to without going through the process that matured them to get to the place where they're at. You know, I've shared this story before, but you know, when I first was called to ministry, um, I was called to ministry under the, uh, uh, the tutors of Bishop uh, uh, Gideon Thompson and Bishop Thompson could, you know, memorize scriptures. I mean, he can memorize like whole chapters and books of scripture and you could just pick a random, you know, Romans, you know, seven and 
13, you know, and he just would know the exact verse and just be able to start from there and start going on. And so I was like, I can't be ordained under ministry under him. I can't do what he's doing. But I negated the fact that there was 30 years of ministry that built him to that place. And so I was just starting out, but I was trying to, um, 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 uh, uh, I, I was trying to assess myself on the basis of someone who was 30 years ahead of me. And this is where you get the kind of phrase or the thought, learn to run your own race. And, and, and while we can be encouraged by others, inspired by others, we all got to run our own race. You know, I, I, I've told Nehemiah many times, you know, of just, you know, some of the things that I did when I was in, in school, but I've got to give him space to run his own race and to be his, be who God called him to be and not to expect him to be um, who I want him to be. Now, I will tell you that because of my African roots and those who are West Indians can also identify with this, that is always a struggle because I, I, I want him to, you know, pick up the baton where I left it off and I, I kind of live vicariously. Uh, we live vicariously through our children and have high expectations, but I want him to run his own race and to do what God has called him to do. So when I share that, one of the things that I propose is that David made a mistake when he went to Philistine territory. That's, that's my thesis. And I don't, and again, I, I, I can't, this is just my, my understanding that I believe that because David was looking to escape from Saul, um, he made a decision, but I don't know that that was necessarily God's decision. Now, it may have been God's decision, but it may not have been. But one of the challenges was, was that because of that decision, it put him in a no-win situation where he now either had to side with the Philistines or he had to go against the people that were giving him safety. Now, could God have provided him land outside of Philistine territory? Very possibly so. I don't, I don't know if that was necessarily God's plan. But what we see here is that sometimes in our quest to do God's will, we make a wrong turn. And when we make a wrong turn, I think one of the challenges is a lot of people and, and I'll, I'll say this for myself, is that we get stumped on, Lord, I want to do your perfect will. And that is something that is a noble desire. But sometimes we get so paralyzed to be able to make decisions because we don't want to make the wrong turn. And, and this might very well have been a wrong turn for David to go to Ziklag and into the Philistine territory. And he found himself in an impossible situation. But don't you know, if your eyes are to the Lord, the Lord can even rescue you out of the situations or the wrong circumstances, the wrong turns that you've made. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times where I, I, I can absolutely say I blew it. You know, this ain't God, this ain't others. This is my, if I can say it, my stupidity. You know, I did stuff that I should not have done. And I knew it, but the amazing thing is God's grace and his mercy. His mercy means that we don't get what we we deserve. You know, we, we don't get the punishment. We don't get the consequence always of the wrong turn, but God is able to rescue us and get us on the right path. And, and I believe that this was an example of showing of God's providential um, um, supply. He provided an alibi so that there would be no way to be able to link um, David with all that had happened um, between um, uh, when King Saul is eventually killed and, uh, and, and uh, before the Lord. And so any, any, um, any uh, comments? Okay. is the wrong I don't know why sorry I'm missing the next part of it ah. 
Sorry, give me a second here. We're having some technical difficulties. All right, so let's now go to 1 Samuel chapter number 30, 1 Samuel chapter number 30, and I will uh, get those notes up. Something not right here. <laughs> Apologize for the technical difficulties. All right, well, I will teach on the fly. <laughs> um, all right, let's read um, chapter number 30 and um, uh, look at some of the insights here from uh, chapter number 30. And so uh, if, if we can read, um, if I can have the first 15 verses, uh, if I may ask uh, Grace, if you can uh, help us. Um, and if we can have um, Joanne, if you can read verse 16 through verse number um, 25, and then I will read 26 and 27. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the Negev and Ziklag. They had attacked Ziklag and burned it. They had taken captive the women and all who were in it, both young and old. They killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. When David and his men came to Ziklag, they found it destroyed by fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left to weep. David's two wives had been captured, Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters, but David found strength in the Lord his God. And then David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. Abiathar brought it to him and David inquired of the Lord, shall I pursue this raiding party? Will I overtake them? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. David and the 600 men with him came to uh, Bezor Ravine, uh, where some stayed behind, for 200 men were too exhausted to cross the ravine. But David and 400 men continued the pursuit. They found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him water to drink and food to eat, uh, part of a cake of fresh, pressed figs and two cakes of raisins. He ate and was revived, for he had not eaten any food or drunk any water for three days and three nights. David asked him, to whom do you belong and where do you come from? Uh, he said, I am an Egyptian, the slave of an Amalekite. My master abandoned me when I became ill three days ago. We raided the Negev and the Kerasites and the territory belonging to Judah and the Negev of Caleb, and we burned Ziklag. David asked him, can you lead me down to this raiding party? He answered, swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master and I will take you down to them. <clears throat> he led David down and there they were scattered over the countryside, eating, drinking and reveling because of the great amount of plunder they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. David fought them from the dusk until the evening of the next day and none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else they had taken. David brought back everything. He took all the flocks and herds, and his men drove them ahead of the other livestock, saying, this is David's plunder. Then David came to the 200 men 
um, who had been too exhausted to follow him and who, who were left behind at Bezor Ravine, they came out to meet David and the people with him. As David and his young men, as David and his men approached, he greeted them. But all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, because they did not go out with us, we will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each man may take his wife and children and go. David replied, no, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and handed us over to the forces that came against us. Who will listen to what you say? The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down to the battle. All will share alike. David made this a statute, an ordinance for Israel from that day to this. When David arrived in, Oops, sorry. <laughs> in Ziglag, he sent some of the plunder to the elders of Judah, who were his friends, saying, here is a present for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies. He sent it to those who were in Bethel, Ramoth, Negev, and Jatar, to those who were in Eror, Sipmoth, Estamoa, and Rachel, to those who were in the towns of the Jer Jeremiahs and the Canaanites, to those who were in Hormah, Bor, Ashan, Atash, and Hebron, and to all those who were in the places where David and his men had grown. Um, so, this is an interesting transition from chapter number 29 to chapter number 30. And um, I thought it's an interesting juxtaposition because um, sometimes it feels like when you're doing the right things for the Lord, everything goes wrong. <laughs> um, I don't know if any of you have ever been in that place um, where you know it feels like, okay, Lord, um, you know, I'm trying to honor you. I'm trying to walk before you. I'm trying to, you know, be your disciple and your circumstances go really bad. Um, and I don't know about you, but some of us, we can feel like 2020 has been <laughs> that <laughs> circumstances going really bad. You know, it, it's like, okay, Lord, you know, like, did I not pray enough? Did I not like, you know, what, what did I do wrong, Lord, that, you know, in 2020, you know, all of this would take place. I mean, <laughs> it, 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 it's funny because, you know, I, I, so was, you know, said on a meme on Twitter, they're like, you know, um, uh, 2020 started six years ago, you know, and it was just like, it, it, it feels long, you know, it just, it just feels like, you know, are, are, are you serious? We're still in 2020. We're still, you know, things are happening. Like uh, just as an aside, um, you know, keep in prayer, uh, our dear brother, um, Fred Hammond, um, uh, uh, he has, uh, uh, there was an announcement that he caught, uh, COVID. And, uh, you know, when I saw the note, I was like, no, you ain't taking out Fred in 2020. I was like, Lord, you can't take him out. Don't take out Fred, man. That, that, that was, that, that, that's, that's the worshiper, man. Like, I can't, I can't deal with that. And so it's funny, not funny, but, um, you know, um, you know, 2020 has been difficult and it, it, it sort of feels like, you know, the beginning of chapter number 30, where, you know, David is a little dejected because he's basically been rejected by, um, you know, the, the Philistines, not even really knowing that the rejection that the Philistines were giving him was actually God's providence. Um, I don't know that David fully grasped that. And, and, you know, you can see by his conversation back to King Ashish, you know, what did I do that, you know, that you don't trust me? Um, you know, those are all things that when you look at it, it, it seems like David is still, you know, full, not fully understanding. But here is the biggest challenge. They get back to their hometown. And when they get back to their hometown, they find that their whole city has been burned, burned, burned down. All the women and children and, and uh, uh, both young and old were taken away. Um, and wow, I mean, can you imagine like you're, you're ex you, 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 
you've been rejected. Then you've got the whole long distance to get back to your hometown. I mean, I, I, I used to travel as a consultant for a while. And I know the best feeling was when I was on that flight that I was gonna be able to get to my home bed. I was gonna be, I mean, it, it may not have had a turn down service. They may not have put the mint, you know, on the on the bed, but it was my bed. I could, you know, be in my pajamas. I could just lounge and enjoy my bed. And so I imagine that David and 600 of his men are looking forward to just coming home, enjoying. I mean, I'm sure that they had some okra stew and some jollof rice ready um, for them, for the for them as they were coming back, and and they were going to celebrate their warriors with some yams and some mango and and all the good fruit of the land. And so, um, and you come home, and what you see is your your land has been burned and all of its inhabitants have been taken away. Uh, you know, I, I, um, I, I, thankfully, you know, I've never had a house catch on fire, but one of our neighbors, a couple of houses over, um, had their house catch on fire. And, you know, there's this just like shock, you know, when you come up and you pull up and, you know, there's what you, you know, you expected to be excuse me, but everything is de destroyed. And so one of the interesting things that we see here, look, let's look here in verse number four. And it says, so David and his men wept aloud until they had no strength left, left to weep. Um, first, men do cry. Uh, so we see it in the Bible. And so uh, for those of our men on the call know that it, it is not unmanly um, to express uh, emotions. But also with that, you hear the depth of their anguish. Um, you hear the depth of, you know, their like just God, why? And um I, I, I don't know about you, but I can be honest and say there's been a few moments in this season of the coronavirus that I've had my God why moments. Um, you know, for me, a lot of it has been around health challenges. And, um, you know, I was telling Pastor Ophelia the other day, um, I feel like I have 16 different specialists uh, for everything, literally from my head to my toe, uh, that is not working as appropriate. Now, on the one hand, I'm amazed at God's ability to make the body work and all the different organs and everything that work um, simultaneously. But on the other hand, when they don't work, oh man, I'm, I'm just like, Lord, um, what are you doing here? And, 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 and I can imagine the level of depth of anguish um, that, that, that they felt. And um, this was not just David as a leader feeling anguish for his people, but David had a personal stake in it. In verse five, it tells us uh, that his two wives, Ahinoam and Abigail, um, uh, the, the widow of Nabal at Carmel, had been taken away. Now, does anybody know why it's kind of interesting the fact that David would be in anguish? Uh, well, uh, um, let me just answer the question and I, it's kind of hard to phrase it, but first David loses his first wife, who was what? What was her name? Michael. Michael. And how did David lose Michael? Saul gave her to another man. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine that? Like, <laughs> daddy gonna say, you know what? I don't like you anymore. You're gonna be, you go, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you off to another man. And I mean, like, that, that's gotta like be some pain. And so now, um, you know, he marries uh, Ahinoam, and then um, he's a kinsman redeemer for Abigail. And now he experiences the same loss again. You know, I, God is interesting sometimes because sometimes I want to be like, God, you know, that is my soft spot. God, you know, that's the area that we don't talk about. God, you know, that's the area we don't mess with. And what did God do? He messed with it. You know, and, and, and sometimes, you know, like it seems cruel 
that God does that, but sometimes God is trying to teach us something, even in the midst of where he touches the places that hurt so much, but really what he's trying to do is help us heal, uh, even in those broken areas. And so as he does that, um, not only is David, you know, realizing that he's lost a lot, not only does, uh, you know, his men, have they also lost their wives and children, but now, you know, David has the responsibility. You remember Brother David uh, here um, told us, you know, like one of the things that the Lord was teaching David was how to lead other people. And this was like boot camp for leading other people. And David was about to get the leadership lesson of his life. What he was about to learn is that they will celebrate you when you do good. But when you jack up, you you are, you know, you're the pig on the spit. You know, you getting roasted. Like they are not, you know, like they, they are like, no, you know, look, look there in verse number six. Uh, uh, Sister Davida, can you read verse number six? Yes, sir. David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. Each one was bitter in spirit because his because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Amen, amen. So David was distressed because literally they were like, stone him, stone him. I mean, you, you, you know, it's like, you know, basically they were like, he made a leadership miscalculation and he needs to pay for it. But here is at the latter part of verse six is one of the most beautiful comparisons and contrasts. Each one was bitter in spirit because of their sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. You know, I want to pause here for a moment and, and, and I want to park here for a moment because I don't want us to miss, and this is point number two, that I want us to see from today's lesson is that no matter what is going on, we can find strength in the Lord our God. Um, you know, I, 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 one of the things that I, I aim to do as a pastor is to un churchify some of our language. Now, I, I have no problem. I grew up, you know, I'm a good old Pentecostal. I grew up, you know, in Assemblies of God, uh, Church of God in Christ. Uh, I, I got a little Baptist in me. I got a little AME in me. I got a little, you know, uh, uh, Reformed. I mean, I've got a little bit of everything uh, within me. Um, but one of the things that, you know, I, 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 I aim to have is that we go from, you know, sister, you got to find your strength in the Lord to, to actually break that down to say, what does it literally mean to find your strength in the Lord, your God? Um, and, and, and I don't want this to be me answering, but I want to ask and open to the floor. What does it literally mean to you to find strength in the Lord, your God? What do you, how do you do that? What does that mean? I mean, is that just a church saying? And, and, you know, like, you know, does that just mean like, oh, you, you know, you, you feel something and you feel goosebumps and, and you get strength in the Lord. But what does that, what does that literally mean? You know, those of us who grew up with good fathers, strong, authoritative mm. fathers, spiritual fathers, I think when we were children, we um, we saw our fathers as kind of omnipotent, mm, mm -hmm. and, and the person who would make everything all right. Mm, mm -hmm, mm. And I don't know if you remember, but I told the story two three weeks ago about uh, Max Licato and his little girl. Yeah, you know, and the fact that they were walking way past where they had ever walked before. She didn't know where she was, but she wasn't worried because she was with her daddy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I, I, I see it kind of that way mm -hmm. David sees God as his father, mm -hmm. omnipotent, who can make everything all right. Absolutely. Um, you know, the, 
so it is having a sufficient enough relationship with God <laughs> that you can be able to say, you can be able to trust him. Um, and I think that's really what faith is because like, <laughs> you know, there are some people that I will entrust with things and I'm like, I'm probably gonna have to do this myself. Um, but there are some people like you can say like, okay, can you help with this? And you know, it's in their hands. They will, they will figure out things. And it's been hard for me because I've been telling Pastor Ophelia, like I was such a, you know, I was a, I went to the library as a kid, probably three or four times a week. And I would read books. I started my own business because I got books on how to start your own business. So I was very uh, a self learner. And so, you know, I think it's been frustrating for me because my children are not always, you know, that way. Um, <laughs> yeah, motivated that way. And, and they have their own strengths. Um, but, you know, learning to trust and even just being able to be like, okay, you know, you've, God's got it and I, I put it into his hands. So what else, uh, what else do others think about what it means to literally find strength uh, in the Lord? I think for me, when those times where I kind of feel lost or, or tired or weary that I have to remember what he's done for me, that mm. helps me find my strength. Mm. Like I have to think about how, where he's brought me from, you know, and all of those times in my life where he's carried me through mm. different situations. And, you know, I rely on the scriptures reading that, but I think going back and, and realizing, you know what, God has gotten me through so much, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. His grace, right? And his mercy. Mm -hmm. And that's how I find my strength in the Lord, like just reflecting on his goodness, reflecting on, you know, his <coughs> and, and everything that, you know, he's done. I mean, that's what kind of gets me back on track. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joanne. Others? Yeah, I just would, um, I guess, in this case, emphasize like how much David is probably carrying at this point, you know, he's mm. led these people, you know, they went into battle, they came back, their homes are destroyed, and their entire families are gone. And, you know, mm. we know that they, they all they know is they didn't find their bodies, you know, mm. like, and like, you know, so all of these people must be going through so much because they don't know where their family is. They don't know if they're okay. Um, and David, you know, the buck stops with him. He's the one who led him to this. So um, that's a lot to, you know, um, to still be able to find strength in God. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a very, very, very uh, astute observation. You know, it's just, you know, so, when I study the scriptures, it, you know, I don't want to gloss over that a lot of things that people did in the scriptures were hard. They were difficult. And, you know, I, th I think we tend to have this mantra that if you love God, everything's going to be easy. <laughs> Everything is going to be, you know, like, you know, just, you know, it's just like, you know, oiled, smooth oiled path. And the reality is that people who love God had to fight some very big struggles. Um, and, you know, we think of the Apostle Paul, who even in the midst of it, you know, was able to say, um, uh, his grace is sufficient for me, uh, that in the midst of all that was going on, in the midst of every struggle, God's grace was sufficient. Um, anybody else? I'm kind of keep going back a couple um, sentences earlier, where it says David was greatly distressed because, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, um, no. So David and his men wept aloud until they mm -hmm. had no strength left to weep. Mm -hmm. Everything has been taken from him. He's bereft of energy even to weep. And, mm -hmm. um, then it says, but David found strength. So he's brought to his knees, his wife, all three of his wives mm -hmm. have been taken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. His people's wives have been taken. His land has been taken. The promise is still out there that he'll be King someday. Saul, Samuel is gone. Um, he has no land. He's got, he's basically got nothing. And, um, you know, when everything is taken from him, he's been training his brother, David is, 
you know, so beautifully constructed for us that ideal for, for this moment. Mm. And in this moment of nihilism and emptiness, mm. um, he turned to the Lord and he found strength and it. it didn't, it doesn't say in his despair, he found strength, mm. but he found strength in the Lord is God. And I think, you know, as I've gone through whatever I've gone through recently, you know, when I, when I, I'm done crying and I just kind of take a deep breath and realize, you know mm -hmm. what, God's got a bigger plan. And I just mm -hmm. have to keep focused on him mm -hmm. and not trying to do it myself the way I need, the way I think it should be done or the way I expect it to be done. I need to have faith that God's got a bigger plan and he'll use me how he's going to use me. And so I just, I look at this and when David says, you know what, stop, <laughs> bring me the ephod. Mm. You know, it yeah. was like, wait, I, I need to be praying here. You know, crying mm. is, you know, it, it rents some of the pain, but we need to go right back to the source. So yeah. I found that to be powerful for me. Yeah. Uh, you know, one, one interesting parallel that I saw in, in reflecting upon the scripture was, remember at the beginning of 1 Samuel, um, there was Elkanah and he had two wives. You remember, uh, the, anybody remember their names? Hannah. Yep. And I can't remember his second wife. Oh, I, I always remember the, the uh, not Saich, <laughs> but Panina, <laughs> yes. I was going to say the ratchet one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> ratchet. Well, Panina was ratchet. I mean, she. You always remember she, Hannah. She was, she was, she was teasing Hannah. She was like, I got babies. You don't got babies. I mean, I think there was a song going. She, she had a blasting in front of Hannah. And, but what, what did Hannah learn to do? She went to the temple. And as she went to the temple, she prayed in such um authentic emotion that Eli the priest thought she was drunk in prayer i wonder if there is something about spirit filled impassioned prayer and you know what's interesting is that ziglag happens at an uh, at an interesting circumstance the Philistines, who he had a relationship with, they're off at war. So guess what? When David finds a situation, he can't turn to his buddies and the, 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 the uh, connections he's made in order to get him out of the situation. You know, I, again, here's God in his providence. Sometimes God removes stuff to get us right where we need to be. Sometimes God makes it so there's no other choice, but we can only turn to him. We can only turn and feast our eyes to him. And sometimes we, we, we weep at that, but God is trying to always bring us to him, bring us to his presence, bring us to his feet. And in the midst of it all, David said, I'm going to find strength in the Lord. Now, you can find strength in the Lord by praying, um, and, and part of that is letting our petition, our requests, uh, petitions and our requests be made known unto God. We can find strength in the Lord by worship. How many of you know that when we worship together, we get strength uh, in the Lord? And so that's why we practice um, corporate worship. But listen, I don't want the only time that you worship God to be on Sunday morning. Look, I don't care what music style you like, find something that is in whatever genre you like, but that you can worship to. And, and just, you know, find moments where you can just go before the Lord and be encouraged, be strengthened before God. And, and this is what happened as David, David says, look, uh, Abiathar, um, he calls him um, the priest and he says, bring me the ephod. And this was the way that in their time that they heard from God. And so Abiathar brought, brought it to him and David inquired the Lord and, and David asked a specific question. So I pursue this raiding party, will I overtake them? And what was the Lord's answer? Pursue them, he answered. You will certainly overtake them and succeed in the rescue. You know, as much as I might experience despair, there is something so comforting in knowing God is with me as I go along the way. And I, I'm sure that that 
word from the Lord encouraged David. Um, now, I, I, I want to make an aside um, because, you know, one of the interesting political um, um, kind of ramifications is that it is great to have a word from the Lord, but we've got to make sure it's a word from the Lord. And a lot of people, their hopes are dashed because they say they heard from the Lord, but it is not necessarily a word from the Lord. So all that to say, make sure it's a word from the Lord. So what happens, David and his 600 men, they came, they come to the uh, Basor ravine and um, um, uh, the, well, the Lord gives them the instruction. And so the men like mount up and say, we're going to go, we're going to fight the battle. You know, it's nothing like, uh, <laughs> you know, when, when you've got confidence that you're going to go and you're going to win, you're going to do great things. Uh, I was talking with brother David, um, uh, at the beginning of the call today, you know, I'm used to as a university of Michigan, uh, you know, foot, uh, alum and a football fan, I'm used to, you know, the thought like, like, all right, we're going into a football game. We're about to win this. Um, this season, not so much. Um, we've been on the um, on the losing side, and especially to our uh, arch enemies, the uh, Michigan uh, State uh, Spartans and the Ohio State Buckeyes. Uh, dare I name them? Um, but uh, uh, it's been a difficult year. But. I know that David and his men, they had just great confidence that the Lord is with us. We're going to fight this battle. And so as they go into it, um, they get to this ravine and an interesting thing happens. As they're at the ravine, there is 200 men or a third of the men who were too exhausted to cross the ravine. You know, sometimes in our journeys, we, we get tired, we get exhausted. And, um, but David told them to stay here and he left some supplies with them and the 400 men who were strong enough kept on going. As they were going, remember a couple of weeks back, we talked about showing kindness. You remember, you guys remember when we talked about showing kindness? Here's the thing, showing kindness is a godly virtue. But here's the other thing, is that when you don't show kindness, it usually comes to get you in the end. And we're about to see how it came to get the, uh, the Amalekites in the end. So we know that the people who had taken over and burned Ziklag were the Amalekites. And so David finds an Egyptian in the field and, they, and, and, and some of, well, some of his men find an Egyptian field and they brought him to David. And they gave him, um, basically, he was basically on his last breath. Um, he was basically about to die. And if you read on there in um, uh, verse number 13, he was an, Egypt, uh, an Egyptian. He was a slave of a Malachite. And basically his master abandoned him when he became ill three days ago. And so what does that mean? It means that because the master, the Amalekite, treated this slave with unkindness, he left him out to die in the middle. I mean, I don't know if it was in the wilderness, but he left him out to die. But here comes David and his men, and they have the audacity to show kindness to a stranger and an alien. Now, there are two benefits of the kindness that they showed. Number one, it is fulfilling Torah obligations in order to make sure that those who were strangers and aliens were provided for. That was a Torah obligation. And, and uh, you know, I, I won't get into the modern day, you know, immigration debate, but suffice to say, the biblical responsibility was to show kindness towards strangers and aliens. And how did they show kindness? They gave him water to drink and food to eat. But not only did they give him water to eat and, and food to eat, but they gave him choice food. They gave him part of a cake of, uh, of, of pressed figs, two cakes of raisins. And the Bible says he ate and was revived for he had not eaten or drunk any water for three days and three nights. And so basically his master had left him three days ago. And uh, because of the unkindness, it was going to come back to haunt the Amalekites. 
Jesus. And so David asked him, to whom do you belong and where do you come from? And basically he says, my master abandoned me. And then he says, yes, we were a part of the raiding parties. And then he says, can you lead me to them? <laughs> and, you know, Egyptian is a little skittish. He's like, well, you know, what are you going to do? You know, like he says, swear to me before God that you will not kill me or hand me over to my master and I will take you down to them. And um, they did so. And so uh, as they went down to the countryside, they saw that all the men basically, um, you know, one translation says they were basically drunk. They were partying because they thought they had gotten, you know, the, the, the score of their life. They had plundered um, uh, things from Philistine and from Judah land. And look there in verse number 17. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Brother David, can you read that there, verse number 17, please? David fought them from dusk until the evening of the next day. And none of them got away except 400 young men who rode off on camels and fled. Amen. And verse number 18, uh, uh, yeah, 18, please. David recovered everything the Amalekites had taken, including his two wives. Amen. Um, it goes on to say, nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else that had taken. David brought everything back. This is the, uh, the point that I also want to emphasize um, here is that God has the ability to restore even which, that which has been stolen from us. God has the ability to put back into place things that it seems that we've lost, things that it seems that we, 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 we have been cast aside. And, uh, you know, if I was preaching this passage, um, you know, we get excited about verse number 18. David recovered everything. David recovered everything. Come on, say that with me. David, David recovered, recovered everything. everything. And it says nothing was missing. Woo, look at God. Nothing was missing. Let me let I don't I don't think y'all are catching this this morning. I don't think you guys are hearing me this morning. David recovered everything and nothing was missing, young or old, boy or girl, plunder or anything else that was taken. David brought back everything. Mm. Not only did David brought, bring back everything, but they had plunder on top of what had been stolen from them. I believe God, he can restore everything back. Mm. And he can also give you even more than even that which you lost. Mm. That's what happened to Job. That's what happened. We see in so many times where God blessed his people even exceedingly abundantly. I was listening to the worship team, uh, their rendition of generous God. And, and, and it's been in my spirit that God is a generous God. And we see it here um, uh, and multiplied. And so it was so much that they said, this is David's plunder that had been coming to them. And so... Here is the interesting thing that happens, and this is the last point that I want to share for this passage as we close out here today. David and them, they're rejoicing. They're excited. They're, woo, yeah, all right now, woo, we got the plunder. And so they take all the land, they take all the, all the livestock, all those things, and they're going, and then they finally get to the place where the 200 men who were exhausted they finally catch up to them uh, on the other side of the ravine. Now, let's look what it says in verse uh, number uh, uh, 21 and 22. It says, as David and his men approached, he greeted them. But then in verse number 20 says, but all the evil men and troublemakers among David's followers said, say troublemakers. 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 We know troublemakers. There's always <laughs> troublemakers. Even when it's good time, there are troublemakers. There are troublemakers all around. And so what did the troublemakers say? They said, you did not go out with us. We will not share with them the plunder we recovered. However, each man may take his wife and children and go. And so basically the troublemakers around them were like, well, look, y'all didn't do the work. Y'all ain't going to get the victory if you didn't do the work. But interestingly, 
Now, let me pause for a second because I saw some of y'all snicker because I believe y'all know y'all would be like that and y'all would say, well, yeah, I don't see nothing wrong with that. I don't see nothing wrong with them saying like, y'all didn't do the work. So you don't get to, you don't get to enjoy the benefit. But David replied, no, my brothers, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. He has protected us and handed over to us the forces that came against us. I, I, I want you to understand and underscore something because it's an important biblical principle. David didn't look at it like I was the great warrior. I got this. So because I got this, it's all mine or it's, oh, it's only the people who fought for it. What David recognized was that this was the Lord's doing. This was the Lord's doing. And he says, you must not do that with what the Lord has given us. How much so does that apply in our lives right now? Don't you know the Bible tells us the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Every blessing, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father, which is above. So the same principle applies. If God is the one who has blessed us, we must not do that. And what is that? Be stingy, be, you know, hoard, not be generous with what the Lord has given us. Has the Lord not protected us? Has the Lord not provided for us? Has the Lord not given us victory? Has the Lord not allowed us to allow our brains to be able to think and to be able to be used in different ways? Has the Lord not allowed our hands to be able to be put to work? Has the Lord not allowed us to be able to be his vessels? And this is what David said. The share of the man who stayed with the supplies is to be the same as that of him who went down to battle. And this is the phrase that I want you to remember this morning. All will share alike. All will share alike. This is my third point for today. God calls us to a heart and the spirit of generosity. One of the things that troubles me as a pastor is that there is a spirit, and especially within the, the body of Christ, that is about self-indulgence and is about selfishness. But we see modeled time after time after time again that God says, be generous, be generous, be generous. Care for the stranger, care for the alien. Came, care for the migrant, care, care for the immigrant, care for those mm -hmm. who maybe didn't fight like you fought, but not be ashamed to give them part of the blessing. You know, David was so generous. Don't, 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 don't miss this out as the, as the chapter closes. Um, David was so generous that when he rides in Ziklag, he started sending plunder to some of the elders who were all around. And he says, here is a present for, me, for you from the plunder of the Lord's enemies. I mean, like David was like, I mean, can you imagine just walking down your street? You get a car and you get a car, you get plunder and you get plunder and you get plunder. I mean, David was just like, look, I didn't earn it. So it's the Lord's to give. And so he was so generous with it. It goes on to list the different places where David made sure that they received a part of the plunder. And he says, look, this is how the Lord has blessed me. I'm not going to keep that blessing to myself. I'm going to share that blessing with those who the Lord has put me in contact with. And I think that that principle is applicable for us today because truth be told, a lot of us are like those troublemakers who were saying, look, well, y'all didn't go out to battle. So psh, psh. <laughs> you should have, you should have went, you should have had the strength. I mean, I'm the one, I'm the one who fought all day. You know, did you fight? Did you do anything? But here's the beauty of God's kingdom. Those who came at the first hour and those who came at the last watch were still paid the same. It is an everlasting principle from Old Testament to New Testament, and we learn from it. 
stay faithful, mm. be generous mm. in all things. Amen. 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 Um, a lot in this chapter, but three key points that I wanted to share with you. Um, number one, sometimes God changes our circumstances so that we can be, um, it, it, it protects us, God protects us from ourselves and our circumstances. Number two is that um, we have to be able to encourage ourselves in the Lord um, and, and, and find strength in the Lord. That means praying, that means seeking his face, that means learning from it. And number three is that all will share, um, be generous and be faithful in that. So um, as we wrap up today, uh, as is our custom, we'll just kind of share some nuggets or things that stuck with each of you um, today. So, you know, Pastor, uh, it, it's it's not just a lesson in generosity. It's also a lesson in leadership when we come back. Mm. Um, if, if you had to distill leadership, the essence of leadership down to 10 points, I'm mm. certain one of them would be all of us or none of us. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's amazing to me when I see leaders who don't grasp that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At one point uh, in one of his campaigns, Alexander the Great was marching his men across the desert. Mm -hmm. They used up all the water they brought with them, and they were about to die from thirst. Mm. literally every man. Two of his advanced scouts came back, and they had managed to find enough dirty water to fill the mm -hmm. bottom of a helmet. Yeah. That helmet, you know, the, a pint of dirty water in it. They bring it to Alexander. And of course, Alexander's holding it and the men are looking at him, you know, enviously. Right, right. <laughs> what does Alexander do? He turns it upside down and he dumps the water on the ground. And he mm. says, it's no good for one man to drink when everybody thirsts. Yes. He didn't have water he could give him. So all he could give him was, was leadership and inspiration. Mm -hmm. That's a key principle here. And to me, it proves in addition to what you so eloquently said, it proves that David is learning his leadership lessons here. Yes, yes, yes. And many of us on this call, you know, we have we have leadership roles in different ways. And, and you know, I think sometimes we don't see, always see how God gives us those leadership um, um, responsibilities, but you can even lead from second chair. You, you, you don't always have to be the named leader in order to lead. Um, you don't always have to have a title in order to lead, but learning how to lead the way God wants us to lead. Um, and we see a great leadership lesson in the life of David, and, and he's learning it on the fly. I mean, he's having to, you know, learn it, you know, kind of the school of hard knocks, um, um, but he's learning. And as you um, said, Brother David, you know, I love that is because we've gotten away from true leadership. And, and I think, you know, one of the things that our our world needs now is godly leaders, godly leaders. And godly leaders have to be servant leaders first. And, and you know, godly leaders, I was always trained that I'm, if I'm a leader, I'm the last. I'm, you know, like I don't get the first, I get the last. And and, and you'll see if, if if those who are enlisted, you know, they're gonna make sure their men are, you know, are take or women are taken care of in their troops. And so um a leadership lessons. Amen. Thank you, Brother David. Pastor, if I can piggyback on what Brother David said, that's mm -hmm. what really stuck out to me. And not his men had seen David as a strong leader, right? He put us into war but he's still demonstrating leading leadership in his transparency and in mm. his distress mm -hmm. and, and also see him mourning and mm. crying and not and not understanding god why like why is this happening but even so he's not like in a corner crying where they don't recognize yeah. see his distress he's right there with them yeah and yeah. This, the idea of servant leadership and transparency and leadership Mm -hmm. It's also important, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. in his distress, he says, he calls for the ephod. He yes. goes and asks direction of God for the next move. Yep. And yep. Um, I think that kind of leading from that kind of position as mm. well as leading from what we see as a strong position, mm. is just as important. Yes. And yes. how God uses our circumstances. The question is always, no matter what, 
the differences and the, and the challenges and the trials might be, the question is always going to be, will you still trust me? Mm -hmm. You know, in the absence of the fulfillment of the promise, will you remember who I am and what I've yeah. already done? And will you trust me even in this? Yes. And yeah. you were um, brought up Hannah. I was thinking of Abraham and Isaac mm. and how mm. Isaac here, he was the manifestation of the promise of God. Yes. And yet God says, take your son yeah. Yeah. and yeah. offer him up and how yeah. God also requires, will you still trust me? Yeah. Will yeah. you still trust me? And it wasn't God that was asking the question. He already knew that Abraham would have obeyed him. Right. But it's for us to realize that right. Right. even when God touches the things that are most precious to us, mm -hmm. I will trust him because Amen. of who I've learned to, him to be and trusted him to be in the past. Amen. Um, and how we just keep coming up. That's our whole Christian journey. We're always going to keep coming back around to these things where God is asking us again, will yeah, you yeah. trust me? Will you will trust, you trust me? me? Amen. Um, Amen. And I thank God for um, the reminder that mm. we're all called to be leaders in a certain way, but it's not just leading from a strong position. It's also leading in our distress. Mm. Mm. Trust God Amen. in every Amen. circumstance. Amen. Thank you for that insight. Thank you. Thanks, dear. So for me, what I took away was basically how people can turn on you so quickly <laughs> like um, for first that they, like first they trusted david and right mm. when they made one mistake they just turned on him and mm. also the men turned on themselves because the 400 men um was mm. that the the 200 men who were too tired to cross mm. the river, um were shouldn't get the plunder so mm. that's that's what I took away that people can turn on you so quickly. Yeah, you know, I, we have the saying, people are fickle, you know, uh, uh, one minute you're the greatest thing and, you know, the next minute you're not. But I think the thing is to remain steady in the Lord, um, even despite how people respond um, and be faithful to the Lord. Um, because um, if you if you respond just based on people's um, response to you, you will not always do the godly thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, think about it. Like if, if, if David was like, oh, y'all gonna talk about stoning me? You know, like, well, I'm gonna stone y'all back. You know, like y'all some, <laughs> some ratchet, you know, ratchet <laughs> troops, you know, like, I mean, David could have gotten like mired in yeah. all of the back and forth. But Dave was like, look, we've got to go before the Lord and say, look, ain't, ain't no sense in, you know, sitting here crying. We've got to say, Lord, what do you want us to do next? And um, um, that's why it's also good to have different personalities of people around you because, you know, there are some people, they're just stoic. Like they're, they're just going to be the ones who are going to be the, you know, all right, let's go before the throne. Like, like, all right, you know, we can't cry about it. You know, it's just got to like our whole house burned. Our whole neighborhood is burned. Our wife and kids are gone, but you know, we, we're not going to, but having different people around you can help you as you navigate through different circumstances. So thank you for that, uh, that summary, uh, Quentin. Others? Um, I just want to follow up a little bit on the the how gen we see generosity happen in this passage. Um, something that I've been spending a lot of time thinking about is, um, you know, when Jesus is asked what the law is, he, you know, it's love the Lord your God with all your all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And it, then he goes into love your neighbor as yourself. But he's but the transition is the second is like it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just that loving, like loving our neighbor, like flows out of loving the Lord. And I yeah, think that. Yeah. David is probably more generous maybe than he would be otherwise because he's been very aware that this six, like he, you know, he needed God to step up and yes. provide him with it, this like success. Um, you know, uh, we live in a, a, a society that's a little bit merit meritocratic, so we are more likely to think that we've earned our success, mm -hmm. but I spend a lot of time thinking about um, in Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of, you know, the Persians or whatever, mm -hmm. like gets like sent into a fugue state and like wanders the like wilderness for like seven years, like an animal or whatever, you know, it's a reminder <laughs> that what we have comes from God, whether or not we are aware of it, including our ability. Yes, um, yes. And uh, we don't hold it as tightly as we think we do, you know, mm -hmm. we can go away in a minute, 
So yeah. our yeah. generosity is supposed to come out of an understanding of everything that we have is a gift. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 And 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 I, while what Grace said sounds so simple, we struggle with this. I mean, let, let's let's be honest. Yes. It is a struggle not to think like I've earned this. I've done, you know, like because we have, you know, we we know the sacrifices we made. I mean, some of us know the extra hours we've been working during coronavirus, and we're like, look, I. I earned this i've done this you know and but to be able to say yes i've i've been a vessel that god has used but it's been by god's strength that he's allowed me to do this and i give him the glory because you know it, it, it belongs to him you know everything belongs to him yes. amen so thank you so much sister grace others when i um would do when, when we had service in person and I would welcome the visitors. That was one of the things that I would say is, we're just a bunch of people who love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul and with all of our strength. And because of that, he has allowed us to love you, our neighbor as ourselves. And so that's a reminder to me. I haven't been able to say that on a weekly basis to remind me of it, but I, I, I tend to, when I'm in my flesh can be a part of the numbered troublemakers. Um, but this is a reminder that generosity and coming out of a spring well of love for the Lord. Um, and it also give, takes you back to having a heart of gratitude um, leads us to a place that is God honoring in our generosity. I don't get it all right. I definitely don't. That's that's why I need our pastor here to be super generous, even when I'm not. Um, but just a reminder that is an outflow of our love for God and an Amen. outflow of understanding that God has given us everything that Amen. we have. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, well, I think that like God is just and mm -hmm. whatever does like I don't know like how when um like David thought he lost everything God mm. was just with him mm. Mm. even though like sometimes we can be like rambunctious he always like wants us to go where he wants us to go mm. his mercy mm. mercy is really good because he never gives up on us Yes, yes, praise God. Praise God that he never gives up on us and uh, he has the ability to restore all. Um, yeah. You know, there have been seasons where I wept because of what it seemed like I had lost. But don't you know that God is able to restore all and in ways that we have not even considered. And, and you know, that, that even, you know, ministers to us when we're anxious, you know, because a lot, a lot of our anxiousness is about, you know, what we're losing or the, the grief of loss. And, um, and we all have that, that anxiety and that anxiousness of Lord, you know, what is going to happen. And uh, I've shared before, I'm, I'm a globalist. Um, and so um, what I mean by that, not that, uh, you know, global world order, um, <laughs> but like, I'll be late to work one day. And I'll be like, I'm going to lose my job. Then I'm going to lose the house. Then Pastor Ophelia is going to divorce me. Then I'm going to be out on the street and homeless. And so like one day of being like five minutes late, I'm already in my mind at I'm going to be homeless and have nothing to eat. Like, and, and uh, like, you know, some of you like, you're like, come on, Pastor Joe. And I'm like, yes, really. That's, that's how bad it is. Like, you know, my, my anxiety can kick in because I just, you know, I, I'm like the Rube Goldberg in my brain of seeing things happening. But, you know, this reminds us that instead of giving space to worry and anxiety, I can give space to trust God because he can put everything together. And even when I feel most anxious, God is with me and God is strengthening me to do what he's called me to do. So, amen. Thank you, Olivia. Others? 
Pastor Joseph, we spoke about this. I'm I'm right there with you on that situation. <laughs> we spoke about it this this past summer regarding globalization. Yeah, yes, and yes, yes. <laughs> yep, uh, I go to the extremes with you as well. Um, <laughs> I'm not leaving you alone on that one. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> We're gonna be delivered. Amen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I showed up late, but I I do love the I do love the um how David was was sharing in his blessings mm -hmm. um, and I do hold on to that and I don't know if I'm right but I do it, it's tough because we live in a world which says no you have to put yourself first mm -hmm. in order to take care of somebody else mm -hmm. and at the same time it seems like through this passage you know David is he's being taken care of by the Lord so that he can take care of other people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that's that's a tough battle for me mm -hmm. um but it's I do like that fact of, you know, you continue to give, but I'm trying to find that right balance. Yeah, no, absolutely. Is, that balance. Um, yeah. So I, I do hold on to First Corinthians 13. Um, you know, though I give all I possess to the poor, but do not have love, I gain nothing. So yeah. it's still yeah. making sure that you're in right relationship with the Lord. Yeah. And it's like constantly checking in. Well, Lord, can I give this? Can I give this? But mm -hmm. what if I don't want you to give this at this time? What if I just want you to love me so that you are fulfilled and then it will become easier for you? Amen. Amen. It's the contention, you know, to learn that balance. But what we, what I would tend to say is that most of us probably can be more generous. That's, that's, I mean, like, you know, like, um, and again, generosity is not just simply with money. Like we, we need to broaden our frame of generosity um bigger than just money some of us we need to be more generous with our time some of us are stingy with our time you know some of us you know like we don't got time for anybody else you know we we just we, and, and some of us our personality is you know we're we're introverts we you know we get exhausted talking to people like and but we we we're not as generous with our time i mean i, I i'm not trying to like knock anybody i'm just trying to be real like some of us we need to be more generous um with um, our work oh okay yes amen uh generous with our words you know how we speak um you know do we show kindness towards others so um generosity is bigger than just financial um as i as i look at it um i see the the, the coincidences you know, oftentimes, you know, we, we look at it and I think, you know, Sister Grace talked about it, um, you know, to a certain degree where uh, people are looking to, to, to say that, you know, I did this. You know? mm -hmm. And if we look through this entire passage, we see coincidences. Yeah. Um, it just happened that they were supposed to go back to. <laughs> yeah. It just happened. Uh, yep. <laughs> Was saved um, from this. Um, it just happened that he had to um, reach out to God to to tell them that they would go catch this party. It yeah. just happened that they found the Egyptian where yep. they found the Egyptian. It just happened, you know. And it and and oftentimes we 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 overlook this, you know, because we we are you know where is God in this? Right. Yeah. <laughs> every single step, step. Yeah. Every single step. just looking at that and just watching and, and, and loving that that's amazing yeah. every single step he's there <laughs> and that brings me back to the point of finding your strength right in him mm -hmm. like yeah. hindsight's 2020 right in the moment you're not seeing all of those coincidences this is, this is right <laughs> yep yeah, but you know when you look back right and when you are trying to find that strength you know, you see, you see his hand at work. Amen. 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 That's what worship does. It, it, it removes some of the cloudiness um, and helps you to see God. Oh, you were there. God. Oh, you were there. Oh, God, you were there. And, and it's amazing how many situations we don't always see, but God is there. Yes, I'd be blessed in my worship every time I, after I drop those kids off. To <laughs> Amen. On my way to work, I just yes. have to Amen. that. Set it. <laughs> And let me tell y'all, I mean, that's one of the challenges of not, you know, 
of, of coronavirus. But one of the best times is when you're commuting, when you're transporting, just to you know spend some time with the Lord. And uh, maybe you can listen to the word, maybe you can listen to some worship music, but um, find some time. And if you're working from home, set aside some time in your schedule. Be like, this is my, you know, you can, you can, you can code it. I have a, 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 a meeting with the, you know, the upstairs, you know, <laughs> whatever, you know, put it on your calendar, but, but set some time aside and, and, and worship God. This, that's going to be your challenge in this upcoming week. Get into a practice and a rhythm of worship, however you do it, but get into a rhythm of worship. Mm -hmm. Nehemiah, you have anything? Uh, what I took away was they can't see you. even in tough times, you can still find strength in the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I see that as a form of changing circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Nehemiah. Anyone else? All right, going once, going I can, I will one quickly. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah no, absolutely. And I'm sorry, I feel like I've talked way too much this today. No, 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 you've been good. <laughs> um, I, I find it really um, helpful. Uh, that David is a role model, mm. uh, wept with his men mm. mm -hmm. or um, uh, God before he went to God and then mm. sought strength from God. And I think what that shows me is that David was human and mm. he was fragile and he hurt just like we do when we're faced mm. with circumstances. And then once you get it out, mourn, cry, anger, vent, however you need to do it briefly, turn it off and, and get your mind back on God and let God change your circumstances and your heart and move and, and be all those things that you've been talking about. And remember, I mean, God's in charge, but it doesn't mean that we don't hurt. And I think it's important yes. to um, yes. acknowledge that. And sometimes we, you know, we're human. We have to, it's, if you're cut, you bleed. Um, if you're hurt, yeah. you yeah. get it out too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think giving ourselves permission to be human. I think, you know, so many times as Christians, we're taught like, well, you, you know, if you're, if you're a real Christian, you know, all you do is pray like, no, but I, I hurt, I, I hurt too, you know, like, and, and, and like, if I can be honest, like one of the challenges I wrestled with a couple of weeks back, uh, well, two, uh, just a week or so back was that um, injustice hurts me personally. Um, and so, you know, when, when people say that, you know, yes, you know, God is on the throne, no matter who is in office, I absolutely believe that, but I still hurt when injustice takes place. And so, um, you know, I think one of the things is given recognizing that the scriptures give us permission to be human. Amen. And, um, and some of us, I don't, I don't know who needs to hear that this morning. But uh, God gives us permission to be human. Um, but as as you said, Sister Jamie, once we've experienced that, we go to God, and um, that's the part that we gotta make sure we don't don't lose uh, lose sight of. So. Sister Onye, Sister Kim, any uh, any concluding thoughts? Thank you for the permission to be human. I needed that. Amen. <laughs> and, and, and permission to be godly. Let me let me make sure I balance that. <laughs> I, I got you. I got I, you. I, I got you. What y'all say? The pastor said I got permission to be human. So <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> but but it is a, it is a good thing to remember. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Sister Kim. Um, we want as we uh, close out today. Uh, we want to remember to keep um, our dear. Uh, uh, sister, Sister Carla, uh, in prayer um, as her uh, uncle um, has gone on to be with the Lord, and uh, uh, the funeral will be this upcoming Wednesday. Um, and so she's uh, been a primary caretaker for him. Um, and so let's just continue to pray uh, for uh, her and the family and the comfort. And uh, we'll be, uh, you know, sending uh, a card and, uh, and condolences on behalf of Marcel uh, family. And so. 
Um, the Lord is good. Um, the Lord is worthy to be praised. And um, uh, let's keep going. Let's keep fighting the good fight of faith. Um, let's believe God um, for uh, God's ability to restore all and to, uh, uh, to bring everything uh, that we need. Um, Sister Anna, we're standing with you in the midst of your your journey, and we're believing by faith um, that um, the the condo you desire at the right price, with the right details, will be uh, will be a blessing of the Lord that the Lord is able to provide. And so, uh, we're we're standing with you on that. For um, those who are looking for employment, we're standing with you um, today. Those who are, um, you know, just need a comfort standing with you today and so is that creepy halloween music behind you that i'm hearing does anybody else hear that no it could just be our creepy kids that are whispering oh <laughs> <laughs> amen uh, well i think on that note <laughs> i think we're we're, we're we're there. <laughs> God bless each of you guys. Have a great week. We, we love you all. <laughs> okay, God bless, God bless you. you. All right. Bye, Bye guys. Bye.